Okay, so let's, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to show you first is a little demo trying to start building a picture of what angles in standard position is. So let's take a look. Let me give us a little bit of extra space here because we're going to run out of space. Um, maybe zoom out a little bit. Here we go. We've got this circle. We call this a unit circle. You can't tell based on the, because uh, there's for some reason no scale, but this is one. Okay, so one, it's positive one, negative one, negative one, right? So, the, so this is a radius of one, which is very important. And as I start spinning it, look at the relationship between the sine curve, which you should be familiar with. And again, it's going to just miss, okay? The sine curve and the arm that is being spun around the circle. So, and this is sine. Zoom in a little bit. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Remember, this is, a, this is a unit circle, so the radius is one, which makes the math simple and allows us to realize that this line here is the opposite, so its length is just the sine of the angle. Don't worry if you don't see that yet, that's okay. You can take my word for it. Which means as I spin this around, you can see, well, this is still positive. The radial arm or the terminal arm is always positive because it's a measurement. This is the y value of this point that's spinning around the circle, right? And so this, this line segment has the length of that y value, like the height of that point from the x-axis. And so notice how sine is positive, 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 positive. And then as soon as the arm drops below, it becomes negative. Let me zoom out a little bit here. And then what happens when you hit 360? Well, it just repeats. This is still getting bigger, but the arm just goes in a circle, and when it gets to the end, it repeats. It ends at 20 just because that's how I made this thing. There's no reason why it ends at 20. <laughs> okay? So as think about the relationship between the sine curve and the arm. Like People, I think, wonder, like, why are we spinning this point around in a circle? Like, What is the point of all of this? Why are we doing this? Right? But this is... Just one of the things that pops out of trigonometry is, yes, we can solve for side lengths and angles in right triangles. That's what you learn in grade 10 and non-right triangles eventually, but Sokoto are right triangles. But then if I, if I take those points and I plot them on a Cartesian plane, all of a sudden we get this ang what we call angles in standard position. Standard position means the, that arm that I'm rotating is... Uh, on, on a circle and between the origin and the point on a circle and starts at this place, right? Starts on the positive x-axis. That's what standard position means, okay? And then again, I can spin it and it has this relationship with the sine curve. Okay, so that's part of it. So let's go back to this and, we, and here's what we're gonna do. You are going to learn how to, well, you did last year, but I'm gonna remind you hopefully, uh-oh, stuck. Remind you how to be a detective. We just spent several units, polynomials and rational functions, doing things that are very algorithmic. There's a process to it. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. Then you're, you get your answer. No thinking required. You're just like a robot doing the same thing over and over and over again. Trigonometry, angles and standard positions, not really like that. You got to get a little bit of information from here, a little bit from here, a little bit from here. You need to understand the context of what you're looking at in the bigger picture. That's what I was saying before. You have to be able to understand those things. So you gotta understand how all these little things relate. And that's what a detective does, right? They're like, a the little bit of evidence here, a little bit of evidence here, a little bit of evidence here, put it all together, points the picture, you're guilty, right? Uh, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna be a detective. We're gonna use things like the cast rule. What does the cast rule tell me? Which of the ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent, right? Positive. Where they're positive, which quadrant they're positive in. So C is cosine, S is sine, T is tangent. What's the A? All of them. Why is that? Because go back to our demo. Uh, whoops. Y is positive, and R is always positive, and sine is opposite over uh, hypotenuse. So it's going to be positive over positive. So sine is positive in that quadrant. Cosine is positive 
in that quadrant. And tangent as well, because both the opposite, which is my y, and the adjacent, which is my x, are both positive. So it's positive over positive, so tangent is positive. Does that make sense? You understand that? Remembering some of this? And then again, that's where, like, if I go back, sine, the function, is positive. Remember we talked about this in the last unit. When is the function positive? When is it negative? When is it above the x-axis? When is it below? It's positive here because that radial arm is y over r, or opposite over hypotenuse, which are both positive. Let's say I spin it to the third quadrant. Well, y is negative. r is still positive. So the sine is going to be negative. And look, the function. Sine is negative. See how it relates? Picture starts coming together a little bit. So sine is, sine is positive here and here, right? But negative there and there. Cosine is positive in those two, negative in the other two. And then tangent is positive in those two, again, because of the opposite over adjacent idea. Now, some of you have heard of this and some of you have not. Apparently, our valiant knights are kicks or ticks. Have, you, have some of you not heard of Sir Kicks or, ki Sir kicks or Ticks? Sir Kicks or Ticks is the grade 11 and grade 12 version of Sokotoa if you've not met Sir Kicks or Ticks. What Sir Kicks or Ticks tells us, we're going to use it momentarily, is that the sine is y over r. That's the same as opposite over hypotenuse, but it's a little bit more useful when we're doing angles in standard position because we're talking about x and y and r, not so much opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse but it is the same thing. So when you look at a triangle in standard position, uh, and you know it's often nice to look at it in the first quadrant here, you can think about how it is related to Sokoto from grade 10. Uh, by the way, cosine's not as obvious because cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's the x value. So notice how like, the height of the triangle and the height of this point don't go together. They're not related. But you can still see how cosine's positive there. And when x is negative, cosine is negative. Next quadrant, x is still negative, cosine is still negative. And then when I continue to spin, uh, x is positive, r is always positive, so cosine is positive again, right? So it's that same relationship. Okay, so be a detective. We've got the cast rule. We've got Sir Kick, Sir Ticks. You can use Sokoto if you like. Sir Kick, Sir Ticks is nice. Uh, now we have to, there's one more thing we have to look at. We've got another little demo here to look at that. And that has to do with uh, this idea of related angles. Now, I think in the past, you've probably heard it referred to as beta. I don't typically use beta. So for me, just so you know, uh, beta is theta Related, you can use beta if you want. I understand what you mean by that, but I use theta related. Oops. I use theta related just so you know it's the same thing. And what is that? That's the, again, we have this symmetry in a sine curve, okay? Where um, if I go back to that previous step, oh, let's go back here, sine. So we see that there's two values two y values that are the same. If I follow this line across, there's a y value there, and there's one that's equal to it over here, right? There's two y values that are exactly the same. And if I kept this going, there'd be two y values that are the same except negative. So in one period of that curve, in one cycle, 360 degrees around the circle, there's two uh, y values that are the same and positive, and then two that are like the same, but negative, right? Maybe it's like 0 0.9 is my value. So right around there somewhere, right? And then right around here somewhere. I've got these four values. And those four values are related to this idea. That here's, here's this angle. See the little blue angle here? I hope you can see it from everywhere. Where you said. There's a little blue angle. That's my angle in the first quadrant. There's, a, there's a, an angle that's related to it in the second quadrant. So the red one here and the blue one here have the same measurement, same angle measurement from the x-axis, right? And that's what we mean by related angle. In every quadrant, there's a related, there, if I take the angle, the related angle, and I apply it to the x-axis and the radial arm, so it's always between the x-axis and that terminal arm, um, 
you get these four triangles. But the trick is, my actual angle is that, right? Is how far from its original position it's rotated. So it rotated all the way around here, but the related angle is the same as the quadrant one angle, in a sense, right? But my actual angle has gone all the way around. But they have this important relationship, little formula, very easy. We're going to write it down in a minute. Just remember that, right? So if I take, if I go all the way around, it creates the same angle as that. That's what we mean by related angles. We have these four triangles. If we're talking sine, the top two are positive, and the bottom two are going to be negative. Uh, not the angle, but the, the sine of the angle, right? Um, so let's see this one. This one's all the way around here, but there's my related angle. It has the same measurement as the original one, okay? And then again, all the way around, but the related angle is the same measurement as the original one and it creates these four triangles and so when I change one I'm changing them all because their related angles have to always be the same that's the whole point of all of this does that make sense if anything doesn't entirely make sense or you're not really sure why we're talking about it don't worry too much but maybe you can make a mental note ask about it after by the end of the sort of lesson and when we're doing all the different kinds of questions hopefully you can start to build the bigger picture stuff. So, what does that mean? Okay, so again, I'm not sure we really need to, uh, we could write this down if we want, if you have this. So let's see, so I've got this is my angle. That's the actual angle that I want, but this is gonna be the same theta and theta, right? Th that, that's my theta related. There's a related angle in each quadrant. We usually restrict it to the first cycle around. Usually restricted to 360. Some questions 180 or whatever, but usually we only worry about 360. After that, it would repeat. If you didn't restrict it, there'd be infinite. This idea of the related angle is a big deal. <clears throat> And then the last thing that I want to think about, well, and it'll come up in a question later, but when my radial arm or my terminal arm is on an axis, these are special cases. There's different ways of solving it. Um, if you have to show your work, usually in, in these cases, you probably get away without showing your work, but um, this is how I would think about it. There's my triangle. As this moves, I'll show you the demo in a second, but as this moves further that way, it's this line right here. I shouldn't call it X, I should call it R. That is getting to be when my radial arm, my terminal arm here, gets onto the axis, it will be the same length, the radius, and sorry, this height which is y, will be the same length. So it's like 1 over 1. So that's sine, y over r. So at 90 degrees, sine is 1. And if you put sine of 90 on your calculator, you'll get 1. And actually, take a look at this. Sine of 90 is 1, right? Same thing. It relates to the graph. Okay, what about cosine? So cosine is this one, it's x over r. So as this terminal arm approaches there, this is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, it becomes zero. So the cosine of 90 is zero. Understanding and picturing in your head is very helpful. Think about, you, think about it on your own time if you get a chance. I think it's an important visualization process to go through. But again, these are special cases of when the terminal arm is on an axis. Right? You can still use Sokotor or ticks to kind of think it through. Okay, so here's all the different kinds of questions that we look at. First one, very simple. If I have um, the related angle is 34 degrees, what is the terminal angle in each quadrant? So this is how we write it. Theta related equals 34 degrees. And again, this might be a visualization more than a memorization process. 
So in quadrant one, I like to use this little thing. I think I made it up, but we're going to use it. So theta like one for quadrant one equals. So here's theta related. So quadrant one angle is the same, right? It's just equal to theta related, which equals 34 degrees. Quadrant two. How do I find the angle for quadrant two? So here's theta related. The related angle is always between the terminal arm and the x-axis. And it's the same in each quadrant. So the terminal angle starts in the positive x-axis and goes around, like the terminal arm. What's the relationship between those two? Hunter? If you add them up, you mean? Good. So how do I find my actual angle? Go ahead. 180 minus beta, or theta related, as I call it. So I went like this, 180 minus that, right? Okay. Uh, which in this case is 180 minus 34. This is not something that like... <laughs> So it's 146, right? You don't need to show the steps for this. We're, we're just reviewing it. So that's why we're showing like this little mini formula. But you wouldn't need to show that work. Okay, quadrant three. What's that one? So there's my related angle. How do I find the terminal angle? Alicia? 180 plus so that should be 214 degrees and the last one is in the fourth quadrant how do I find that one 360 minus. Thirty-four. So three twenty-six in this case. We're never it's never from ninety or two seventy. You should know those numbers, right? Uh, in grade eleven, those are the important numbers, and then you also would know like one thirty-five, one fifty, um, 120, like you would kind of be familiar with some of those common measurements, but that's part of what changes in grade 12. So it's good, it is good to know those, but that will change starting tomorrow, the grade 12 flavor of this stuff. Any questions about any of that? That's just finding, that's just relating the related angle to the terminal angle in each of the quadrants, how, how you would relate those together. And again, it could go around, that's just the 360, it could keep going around, but we don't usually worry too much about that. Once in a while, it'll be a little bit over, but you should be able to do it. Which quadrant the terminal arm is in is one of those pieces of evidence that you're always looking for. You're always thinking about, is it in quadrant one, two, three, or four? That's going to tell you a lot about, the, about like how to answer it or one of the important pieces of information about this. Remember, you're a detective. The, the pieces of information come from different areas. It's not a process with steps. Okay, let's keep going. The point, P, negative 512, lies on the terminal arm of an angle in standard position. This is just the general mumbo-jumbo stuff that kind of, you know, introduces the question. This is a typical kind of question where it gives us a point. And in this case, it asks us to state each of the trig ratios and each reciprocal ratio um, and determine the related angle and then the actual angle. Very interesting. Let's get started. First thing I'm going to do is sketch. I like to do a lot of little sketches. It does help show some of my thinking, but it also just focuses my own thinking. You know what I mean? So let's do this. Negative 5, 12. Negative 5, positive 12 is there. 
So here's the terminal arm. The terminal arm passes through that point, perhaps. It doesn't necessarily end up, it doesn't matter one way or another, really. But any point on that line would give us the same answer to all of this, right? So this is how I like to do this. X is 5, negative 5, right? But it's a measurement of 5 this way. Y is 12, it's a measurement that way. I'm going to write all these out. X equals negative 5. Y equals 12. What does R equal? For a question like this, you want to get all three of them. X, Y, and R. Like You, you need all three values. How do I find R? Mason? Yeah, that's what I would do. Is that what you would do? So that should give me 13. So R is 13. This is where Sir Kicks or Ticks comes into play. So sine of theta is Y over R, which is 12 over 13. And sine is positive in that quadrant. We don't need to worry about that necessarily, but it matches what we know with the cast rule, right? Cosine of theta, we don't know theta yet. We are supposed to find it, but we don't know it yet, is x over r, so kicks or ticks, so that's negative 5 over 13. And tangent theta is... Uh, y over r, so that's, or sorry, y over x, so that's negative 12 over 5. What are my, what does it mean by reciprocal ratios? Sorry? Cotangent is one of them. Cotangent is the reciprocal of? Tangent, right? So it's the same but flipped. That's what we mean by reciprocal. What are the other two, Zoe? Yep, and which goes with which? <laughs> you you got to know this, right? So I don't know. The way that I remembered it is it's backwards from what you would think. You would think cosi, cosine and cosecant go together, but they don't. So it's just opposite. Secant goes with cosine. So it's the flipped version. You don't change the sign. And cosecant goes with secant. And that is uh, 13 over 12. Yeah? Pythagorean theorem. My bad. All right, last little bit of this one. Determine the related angle and the actual angle. When I could use any one of these six, although the, your calculator doesn't have a button for the reciprocal ratio, so you're going to use one of the three basic ratios. Um, how do we do it on our calculator? Here's uh, all. This will come up again, but remember, we don't worry about the negative. So if I was going to use cosine, I would ignore the negative. Okay, putting the negative in will mess things up. We're looking for the related angle first. That's always what we do. If you rely on your calculator without understanding what you're doing, inevitably you're going to make mistakes. So we're not going to rely on our calculator. We're going to understand what we're doing. And so I'm going to go shift cos of 5 divided by 13. Make sure you've got brackets around the 5 divided by 13. It's going to give me an answer of 67.38. We're going to round to the what nearest degree it doesn't say so if cosine of theta equals uh, just positive 5 over 13 theta gave me 67 that's my related angle because that's it oh the related angle is the quadrant run angle but we don't think of it that way even though they're the same try to always think it's the related angle if you happen to be looking for the angle in quadrant one, you have no more work to do. But the calculator always gives you the related angle, right? Regardless. 
Uh, now I need to turn that related angle into the actual angle. That's the part that my calculator doesn't do for me. I need to understand the bigger picture and get this. So I know from my little diagram, in this case, and from the point that I was given, that I'm in uh, quadrant two, right? We know that. So I just use the quadrant two formula and I go theta in quadrant two is 180 minus 67. So that's gonna give me 13 degrees. No, <laughs> not even close, 113, sorry. That makes more sense. And that's it, find the related angle and then the actual angle, the terminal angle. That's how you do that question. Everybody good? Yep. Wait, for, does it matter if you use the, does it have to be cosine theta? No, you could have used sine, cosine, or tangent. I use cosine just to point out, drop the negative. But in that case, you could use any of the three. That's just one type of question, but it does relate a lot of the ideas. And that's the specific type where it gives you a point on the terminal arm. Okay, special triangles. What do you remember about special triangles? There's two of them. Okay. Um, the way that we label them is just convenient for how we use them. Okay. So the first one, let's do this. There's my right angle. It's an equilateral triangle, which means each of the angles is 60 degrees. So that's 60 and that's 60. But this one up here is not 60 because 60 plus 90, right? The whole thing across it would be 60, but this last little bit is 30. So that adds up to 180. And then, I don't know what you remember about special triangles from grade 10, but what I'm saying is we label them in terms of like a unit, but this could be converted to any number, right? So we, in this case, we're gonna call this one two. So that half of that gives me one. And then I use Pythagorean theorem. This one works out to be the square root of three. That's my one, two, root three triangle. You gotta remember where the one, the two, and the root three go. One and the two are probably pretty easy because you know which one's bigger than the other. And where does the square root of three? Well, it falls in between the other two, right? So if you just think about the magnitude of those lengths, one is the shortest, root three is the next, and two, that's like easy to label. I don't know. Or you might have your own way of thinking about it, rebuild it from scratch like we did there. But you, but you want to have these memorized. The reason is because 30, 60, and 45, which is in the next one, come up often. These are often measurements, so that's why they're the special triangles. Okay, so for this one, here's my right angle. And this is an isosceles triangle. So that means the other two angles are equal, so they are both 45. So there's two ways that you could label this one. If I called this one and I called this one, this would be the square root of two. Again, just with Pythagorean theorem. Like I just chose one, there's nothing about magic about that. Why is it one? No, 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 we chose that. If I wanted the side length to be five, I'd multiply everything by five, that special triangles, right? Proportionally, they'd be the same. So it'd be five, five, and five root two. The other way of uh, labeling it, which you might kind of do in your head, or you might kind of realize is if I label this the square root of two, and I label this the square root of two, then this one becomes two. I multiply all of those by the square root of two. I get kind of a different way to label it, can be convenient in some cases. You don't need to know that, it's just kind of interesting. Okay, the point of the special triangles is that we can, we can find exact values of questions when they're set up the right way. So this is another famous kind of question. Determine the possible values of theta. There might be one, there might be two. If it's from zero to 360, that's the most that there could be. There won't be more than two. 
for each of the following. One over root two is which of the special triangles? Nathan? Oh. Which one has one and root two in it? That's the 45 one. The other one has one and two, but not one and root two. That tells me right there that my theta related is 45 degrees. That's what that tells me. One piece of evidence. So this is what I mean by you're, like you're a detective, but you need the bigger picture. Some people would look at that and be like, great, sine of theta is 1 over root 2. I don't know what that's telling me. Like, what information is that giving me? Do I put it in my calculator? No, you don't. Right? You understand, hey, 1 and root 2, that's one of the special triangles. Which one is it? It's the 45 one. So 45. Uh, now I'm going to use cast. We almost always use cast. So if you're unsure of what to do, you can start with cast. The result that I'm given here is positive. What I mean by that is this part right here, that's positive, right? That's a positive number. There's not a negative sign in front of it. It's positive. It could have said sine theta is negative 1 over root 2. It says positive 1 over root 2. That tells me I'm in one of those two quadrants, or both. Sine is positive in both, so it works for both. So I have two possible answers here. If, if it was cosine theta is positive 1 over root 2, you wouldn't have those two answers, right? You have two different answers. Okay, so sine's positive in these top two quadrants. So theta in quadrant 1 is just 45, and theta in quadrant 2 is 180 minus 45, which is 135. You don't even have to say which quadrant, like if you just said theta equals 45 comma 135, that would be fine. But this is the thinking process. Which quadrant is it in? How do I know? Sign is positive in those top two. This is positive, right? That's the thinking process. But once you get rolling with this, again, you wouldn't need to like even show that little step. You could just kind of come up with the answers. But you do always need to state that. That's showing your work. Theta related equals 45 degrees. Then state your final answer. Next one, cos theta is negative 1. How do we solve this? So this is one of, again, these, these ones are, for some re reason, elusive to people. Like, they never quite get it. So let's see if we can think about it. So it's, gonna, it's negative 1, so it's, it's on one of the axes. And where is cosine equal to 1 or negative 1? It's going to be on the x-axis. And I know that because, again, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And when I bring this one down here, they're the same length. Right? Watch. So this is, this is a hypotenuse. This is adjacent. When I bring it down, they're the same length. So that's where cosine is 1. There's my adjacent. It's 0 at 90. Cosine of 90, put it in your calculator, equals 0, right? There, it's negative 1, because <coughs> cosine's negative, because cosine is my x, so that's where it's negative. So in this case, you would just say theta equals 180 degrees. If I'm doing anything and it goes over your head, that's totally fine. That's expected. We're covering a lot of material in a short amount of time here. So that's fine. Ask about it. Don't let it pass before the test. We will go over all this again with the grade 12 twist. But make sure you get it. Make sure it makes sense before we go on. Whoops. My answer disappeared. So theta is 180 degrees. That only has one answer. 
Okay, there's not two possible answers between zero and 360 degrees for that one. Moving right along. This one's like the flipped version. So the other one was giving me, um, giving me the result, and I had to find theta. This one's giving me theta, and I have to find the result, find the exact value. What is the tan of 225? These days, if you have a calculator that, uh, what's it got, real view or something like that, natural view or, or whatever it's called, it'll actually give you basically the answer. But you have to show your work, and often we do part of this test as a no calculator part. So if you do everything relying on your calculator and then the no calculator part of the test comes up and you don't know how to do anything, then that's going to be a problem, right? So you got to understand this. Don't rely on your calculator. Okay? And you can, you can do that for yourself by while you're practicing, force yourself not to cheat. It's just, it, it, it's useless. Why would I bother? Tan 225 equals, get my calculator, show me the answer, write it down. No, it's a waste of your time. Okay? Because you, you have to be able to A, show your work and be do it without a calculator when I ask you to. Okay, so again, let's go. What is, what is, the, where are all the different pieces of information? 225 tells me what? Sorry? Very nice, so I'm in quadrant three, which means I can figure out Right, I can figure out the related angle because it's here. So 180 plus something has to give me 225. So what is that something? This is where you can use your calculator, although I guess on a test you'd have to be able to do it in your head. Here, 45. So off to the side, whoa. Off to the side, I'm just gonna write theta related equals 45. But this is how you would show your work in a question like this which equals, oh, and the last piece of the puzzle here. So tangent positive in that one. So it's going to be positive. Tan of 25 is equal to positive tan of 45. And then I use my special triangle, which is opposite over adjacent. So 1 over 1 or root 2 over 2. So that's 1. And then you can check it on your calculator if you want and make sure that that's the right answer. Not a bad idea. Let's try another one. So again, what do we start with? 210 is still in the same quadrant. But this time I'm adding 30. 180 plus 30 gives me 210. So theta related is 30. I'm just writing that off to the side to remind myself. And what do I know about cosine in quadrant 3? It's negative, so this equals negative cosine of 30. That line right there would be worth a mark. That's how you would show your work. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't just use your calculator. You can't just write the answer. You would be required to show that step. And the cosine of 30, so I'm in the other triangle here, is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's negative root 3 over 2. Let's try another one. Cosecant of 405. You don't see too many like this, but it, but once you get it, not that hard to start changing it a little bit. How would I do this one? So 405 goes all the way around 360 plus another 45. So 
So again, that's still giving me theta related. It's in quadrant one, related angles 45, cosecant goes with sine. Sine is positive in the first quadrant, so it's 1 over sine of 45. I know there's a lot here, folks. I know. This is why I posted, like, you could maybe get a head start on some of it over the weekend. Don't blame me if you didn't, but this is good stuff to practice. So that's just the reciprocal of the sine of 45. What's the sine of 45? 1 over root 2 opposite over hypotenuse, 1 over root 2. So this is root 2 over 1 or root 2. Last one. This is an important one because it's got a little step at the end. I don't know if you see too many like this either. I don't know why it's negative 120. Oh, the textbook does do that a little bit. Not really supposed to, but it does do that a little bit. Uh, but regardless, if I was doing negative 120, I would actually start here and go negative. Like I would, it would be going the other direction. So that puts me there. So it's kind of... I guess tricky, but how do I figure this? Well, this is going to be 60. So that 60 and 120 equals back to the kind of 180. Like I think you could probably figure that out, right? So theta related is 60. And tangent is, this cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Tangent's positive in that quadrant, so it's going to be positive. So this is going to equal 1 over the tan of 60. Go back up to my special triangle. The tan of 60 is opposite over adjacent. So root 3 over 1. So the reciprocal of that is 1 over root 3. What do we do with an answer that has a radical in the denominator? We rationalize it. No irrational denominators. I hope you remember this and you did this in grade 11. You should have. So how do we do that? Multiplying by root 3 over root 3. Square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is the square root of 3 squared, which is 3 and 1 times root 3 is root 3. Again, if you need more detail on that or more practice, see me, ask me, and go over it more. That's a quick little refresher about if it ever turns out that you have a radical in the denominator, you need to rationalize it. That's a standard. I added this in for all of you who printed it out. Yes, this is new. This is the question that people like, we do all of this really hard stuff, and then I put this question on the test, and they're like, I don't know how to do this one. And, and, I, and I pull my hair out. Because it shows lack of understanding of a bigger picture, which I get, I get, trust me. Everybody who's in angles in standard position for the first time, or even the second time around, it's a lot, like it's very different the way we're a detective and we're pulling in pieces of information from different places. But you should be able to figure out how to do this one. So again, I'm looking for theta between 0 and 360 to two decimal places, not exact value because it doesn't give me a special triangles answer here, but it gives me the same thing. Cos theta equals this. It's the same thing as sine theta equals that. It's just that's a fraction and this is a decimal. But it's not different. So what is this telling me? Um, cast. It's cosine. It's negative. So where's that? That's these two. Where cosine isn't positive. Okay. Uh, this is the one time 
where we would, so 3420, I gotta remember that, where we do use our calculator, so you wouldn't get one of these on the no calculator part, shift coast bracket, oh, I forgot already, what is it, 0 0.3420, is that right? Yeah, thank you. 70. So theta related is 70 degrees. Again, notice I dropped the negative when I put it into the calculator. So I need theta in quadrant two, which is 180 minus 170, or sorry, 70, so 110. And I need theta in quadrant three, which is 180 plus 70, so 250. We're doing okay on time here. We're a little pressed. We got 10 more minutes. We got one more kind of big thing to do. Any questions before we move on? All right. Later on, we're going to spend two days on graphing and trig functions with the grade 12 spin on it. But again, the better you are at the grade 11 version, trust me, you're going to be way better off. This is something that's a little bit tricky. I have a way of graphing. I'm going to show it to you. If you have a different way of graphing and it works all the time, you can do it. I think for most of you, the way I do it will be familiar. If you were only okay at it last year in grade 11, I would strongly recommend you use this method. All the methods I've ever seen, this is the most straightforward, awesome, simple one. It's really, really good. But, and I think most of you do probably do it a similar way. I call it, well, I, don't, I didn't come up with this name, but it's called the five key questions method of graphing trig functions. You got to know the five questions and then realize there's actually sort of six and a half questions, which is kind of weird. But you got to know the five questions, know how to answer them. What we're doing here is transformations. The A value, the K value, the C value, the D value, that's what we're doing. But in periodic functions, it's a little bit different. Because the C value, like, it doesn't really shift horizontally, it exists everywhere. It's a phase shift. It's a little bit different, right? Um, the K value is a change in period. It's, it's got a, a bit of more of a, a different and kind of an interesting uh, change to it in periodic functions. So if we know the five key questions and we can answer them, then all of a sudden you can graph it really easily. Question number one is, uh, you call it the axis, I call it the zero line. So for this, this first curve is sine, uh, sorry, I should say y equals sine of x. The second one is cosine, right? That's what sine, you have to know what they look like. You have to know what sine looks like. You have to know what cosine looks like. That's a pretty big deal. So the zero line, and this is for the parent function, is y equals zero for both of them. Question number two is what's the amplitude? So it's one for the parent function. And with that, we get the max and the min. And this is the zero line and the amplitude. So the maximum is the zero line plus the amplitude. And the minimum is the zero line minus the amplitude. And notice that negative one is the minimum and one is the maximum, one is the maximum, negative one is the minimum. Question three is where, where does it start? For the parent function, it starts at zero. Question four, what's the period? The period is equal to 360 divided by k. k is one, obviously, for this. So it's just equal to 360. And five, you take those and you figure out where it stops. So zero, it's the start plus the period. The parent function goes from zero to 360. 
Those are the five key questions. You know those five questions. You have almost everything you need to graph. But the last thing that's very tricky, and this is the part that you want to be a master at with the grade 11 version, because grade 12 version, this is where some people never clicks for. Okay, it is tricky. Is how do I de how do I design my scale? How do I what do I count my x's by? The y's is probably easy. What do I count the x's by? So we break that up into two little parts. Critical points. is your period divided by four, which in this case is 360, divided by four, which is 90. What do I mean by critical points? Just watch. The first one's always at the start, okay, zero. So I go 90 and I find the next one. It's for sign, it's where it hits the max. And then the next one goes back through the zero line, 90 more back through, sorry, hits the minimum, and then 90 more back on the zero line. So that's the sine curve. Starts on the zero line, goes up to the max, back down to the zero line, down to the minimum, back to the zero line, and it happens at the critical points, right? Every 90. Cosine is different. Obviously, it starts at the max after 90, zero line, 90 minimum, 90, zero line, 90 maximum. Obviously, with transformations, that changes. These are the parent functions. The last little step, so this is the six and a half question, is the X scale. Yes, you always divide your period by four to get the critical points. Why? Because one, two, three, four. There's four spaces between the critical points. What do you divide by to get your X scale? Depends. This is the hard part. So there you have choice here. There's no right or wrong. But what I would do is I would take you take this and I would try dividing by three. In this case, I got 30. That has to match your phase shift, which is where it starts. As long as they match, you're good. You'll see when we do an example. We've got four minutes. I think I can do an example in four minutes. If they don't match, you have to try something else. Try dividing by two. Try dividing by four. Try dividing by five. We're going to do this down the road, so it'll, we're going to come back around to it. That may not make a lot of sense. Essentially what you're doing is how many squares, one, two, three, to get to a critical point. And your start has to be on a point that's on your grid. And then every other point that comes after it has to land on a point on the grid. If you're plotting points between grid lines, you're gonna lose a mark because you've picked the wrong X scale. You might wanna just put your pencil down and watch. Cause you probably won't be able to keep up since we only have four minutes. But here we go, this is, the gra this is what I'm gonna graph. Y equals negative three sine two times X plus 30 degrees minus two. Question number one, what's the zero line? That's my vertical shift up or down. So it's Y equals negative two. Question two, what's my amplitude? It's three, not negative three. It's positive three. Amplitude is a measurement of uh, magnitude of size. It's always the absolute value of the A value. It's three. What's my max and my min? Negative two plus three is negative one, negative two minus three is negative five. Those are my max and min points. That's where I know where to put the, the, uh, the critical points once I get everything done. Question three, the start is my phase shift. It's negative 30. Question four is my period. It's 360 divided by the K value, which in this case is two, so it's 180. And my stop is negative uh, 30 plus 180, or vice versa, which is 150. So I need to make sure that my graph has all the way from negative 30 to, to 150. Questions might be a little bit different. It usually asks you to graph one cycle might ask you to graph one cycle between zero and 360 or something, like starting at zero. That's different from what we're doing here. And might ask you to graph two cycles. That's different as well. We've got two minutes. Here we go. It's critical points is the period, which is 180 divided by four, which is 45. And my X scale, remember, I'm going to guess and do 45 divided by three. And that gives me 15. Does, does that match my start? Yes, it's a factor of 30, so it matches. In other words, 
my start 30 is going to be on a point. And because I divided my period to get it, I'm good. Everything else will work. Okay. Uh, I should have had this set up. Okay, so I'm going to put a line right about there. And I'm going to put another one right about here. Whoops, that didn't work. Okay, and I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm counting by 15, so that's negative 45. 45, one, two, three, 90. One, two, three, uh, 120. One, two, three. Whoops, that's wrong. Sorry, 135. One, two, three, 180. That's over 150, so I'm good. I start at negative 30, and on the zero line, because this is sine, that's negative 2. I'm just going to count by ones. It's flipped. So instead of going up, like sine usually does, I'm going to go down. So I'm going to go down to 5, negative 5, and 1, 2, 3. Remember, I'm counting by threes. 1, 2, 3, back to the zero line. 1, 2, 3, to the maximum. 1, 2, 3, back to the zero line. Draw my curve. It's a thing of beauty. That was fast. That was a lot of information all at once. But that was all of grade 11 angles in standard position in one hour. That's about as fast as you could do it. Try your best. See you tomorrow.